try to break that loop, that cycle of you give me a bunch of information, I give it back to you. You give me a good grade because I give it back to you the way you wanted it. Try to break away from that and get kids to be real 21st century critical thinkers about the content they want to learn, how they want to learn it the best, and then creating their own meaning from it. But one of the ways I found to do that is, is Hyperdocs. Anybody familiar with Hyperdocs? Mm -hmm. Here, got a session on Hyperdocs. Hyperdocs is a, a fantastic way of delivering sort of a blended learning model in, in your contemporary classroom. And this Google Sheets presentation is a Hyperdoc. So Hyperdocs have embedded links in them that allow people to go on their own sort of learning journey. They, they use those links as a resource and that takes them where they want to go and they get to explore. So you put in the short URL there or you can just scan the QR code and you will have access to all of my first unit learning resources. There's a small group of, of teachers at our school who are constantly looking at ways to leverage technology and we're bouncing ideas off of each other. And they provide a lot of the information for me and what I do in my classroom. And as physics teachers, there's another physics teacher with me at the school, We'd already been kind of going in this direction, uh, trying to provide external content for the students, uh, videos and resources and interactive applets that they could access on their own to guide their own learning. But we never really opened the doors entirely. They still had to follow the questions with us. Uh, so this was really our first, our first jump towards that kind of system. And it's been met with some mixed review. Some students love it. They, they love the independent nature of it. They love the self-directed learning. Other students are, are so conditioned to be, being given the information that they need and they're just regurgitating and getting, getting a really good grade for it uh, that they struggle. They struggle with the model. So let me just say that up front. A couple of people I want to acknowledge. Some, some people at our school, as well as this individual, Ben Cannon, he teaches at a high school in, in California. They have a very different approach to curriculum and education than we have here. But he teaches physics. And I actually stumbled across his content online just by accident. I was just researching something one day. And he had a Google Doc there. And I was like, this is really good stuff. And so I requested a share on it. You can request a share on, on Google Docs. And I wrote him a whole blurb there. I said, here's who I am. Here's what I teach. Here's where I'm located. It looks like you got some really good stuff. Is there more of this? And can I have it? Because it looks really good. It looks like you're doing what it is we're trying to do here at our school. And he wrote back and said, it's all yours. Here it is. We have Google Slides, Google Docs. We have all kinds of assessments, summative, formative. They're all yours. Uh, and so he has this great hub. And if, if you get the presentation, you can go to the new website and check out what they're doing. Um, he said, share it, just acknowledge us when you do, because uh, we're trying to take things in a different direction as well. Uh, we want to get our name out there as well. So go ahead and have a look at that. So using this technology, one of the reasons why I like using HyperDocs is that it brings learning out of your notebook. So it's visible, I can see it, it's on their screens. It's shared content, sometimes it's shared content between them, sometimes it's shared content with me. But it's all very visible, it's all easy to see. And it also reduces paper consumption, which is something that the board has an initiative on. So I'm not constantly making handouts. I'm not constantly providing quizzes in the form of paper. I'm not constantly providing graphs in the form of paper. Uh, instead, what I do is I provide data in the form of a Google Sheet and share that with my students. The other reason I like HyperDocs as a way of uh, sort of guiding our lesson is that it kind of removes the veil on what the lesson's going to be. So I share that document with my students ahead of time. It's got all the links that they're going to access or could access during the, the lesson and all the activities that we're going to do. And so they have a very clear outline of what needs to be completed in that unit of learning. It might be a day, it might be two days, it might be three days. And I like this idea that they have to go to these external links and then come back, and then populate that document. Sometimes they're populating it together, sometimes they're populating it individually, but they're the creators of their own content, they're the creators of their own note. Uh, they're archiving their own learning for themselves. It's not just the material that I put up on the board that day. And I like this, I like this quote, so I'll let you, let you read it. 
talk about it. So one of the things I've I've done this year. Let's get back to the first slide here. These two books were guiding my thinking. So the one on hyperdocs is how I frame my lessons. And the second book on, on hacking assessment was, was the other thing that framed my thinking, which is that you don't need to grade so much stuff. That really what we should be trying to do is create coaching opportunities for our students. And, and HyperDocs allows me to do that. Because the students know what the lesson is, because they know what resources they have to access, because they know what activities they need to do, oftentimes I can send them in different directions. And they work independently. And while that's happening, that gives me an opportunity to go around and, and coach more. Because I'm not up at the front, I'm not the one delivering, delivering the information. So the two things sort of work in conjunction. By using HyperDocs to do kind of a blended learning thing, the kids become independent learners, but I also become more their, more their coach. And, and their, their place to touch base, as opposed to being a guy who's really, really good at writing on the board. So a hyperdoc is just a Google Doc. It can be any Google Doc. It can be a sheet, it can be a document, it can be slides, it can be a form. It could be all of those linked together. Okay. Um, that provides students an opportunity to engage with their course content in a number of ways. Uh, so you're linking in resources to that one or two documents to allow them to choose a path for their learning for that period. Sometimes I'll have them, they have to complete everything on a hyperdoc. Sometimes I'll allow them some choice. And I'll, I'll show you some more examples as we go on. But what I really like about HyperDocs is that they are transformative. They are interactive. So students are rarely just sitting and writing. Uh, they really do have to engage with the content. They really do have to be kind of guiding their own learning. Um, and I think what's important is kids today live in a world where they view a lot of their content online. If there's an advertisement and it doesn't engage them, they only have to wait five seconds and they can skip it. Okay. If there's a video and they don't like it, they just skip it to the next one. So I think it's important that with our content, if we're delivering it online, that they have lots of different paths that they can explore. And if one path doesn't work for them, allow them an alternative path. And the HyperDocs allows you to do that. They're not a substitution for note taking, although on the surface, it it would feel like that because they are retaining a copy of their learning. It's just not paper. Learning. It's just not not paper and pen. It's just not in a notebook. Okay, it lives out there on the web, and they, they keep it forever. It's not a digital version of a worksheet because it blends the the blurs the line between an inquiry lesson where kids are going out and finding their own resources and learning on their own, and a worksheet itself. It does kind of guide their learning the way a worksheet. It's a multi-layered approach, so really there's a number of different ways that students learn. Some, some learn visually, some learn by reading, um, others learn by doing. And so when you use a hyperdoc, you have an opportunity to engage all those students in, in the learning that works best for them, or sometimes two of the three work best for them. And so you can hit a lot of those points every single day. So for instance, some of my students just love every day that there's a video there, and that's, that's what they pick to do. Other students like the opportunity to get up and go over to the motion detector and practice certain motions in front of the motion detector and get that data and then go back to their desk and grab it. It is a blended learning and I subscribe to this idea of like a rotational model. So students shouldn't be in their desk just working away, hammering away on their on their computers, okay, in isolation, but they should move around the room, they should be picking different activities and they should be working with different people. So at different points in the lesson, we get up and we move and we try different stations. So not everybody's working on the same thing at the same time. And the nice part about that, and I said this before, is that it gives me a chance to go around and mm -hmm. The other thing I want to mention is that I do do a lot of traditional instruction as well. There's times where we have to all come back and we do have to do a written note. And I do have to be the one at the board. I do have to be the one providing the instruction. I do have to be the one showing them how to do the graph properly. Because they will get lost if you don't build those opportunities in as well. 
But I think what's best is that there's a variety of teaching methods and practices, and it, it becomes individualized for the student. The learning becomes individualized for the students. So we talked about the fact that we can hit multiple intelligences. We talked about the fact that it provides a clear outline for students to follow. Uh, and, and the nice part is it allows for, for collaboration. So the students can, can work on a document together in groups, or they can work on them separately, or they can work in larger groups, or we can have the whole class work on one one document as a whole. A couple other nice things, students always have a permanent copy of the lesson. It's a living document, so sometimes we'll do a little bit of work in class and then I'll say, your homework is to go and add some content to this. Once you go home and you explore these other resources, now I want you to go and add to it later. So the learning doesn't stop, it's very continuous. And because it's collaborative, you get sort of this the shared understanding that, that students have. There's a lot of relevancy and discovery that goes on with this as well. One of the things that I like is that the content that you're providing them is most up to date. So you can find news articles and you can link them in to your content. Or you can find new discoveries or, you know, I teach science, so a lot of things become outdated. Okay? Models become outdated, theories become outdated, or new theories start to emerge and you can, you can link those in so you're constantly using the most relevant content. <coughs> The when and where of this sort of note-taking also changes because students who are way sick don't have an excuse for not engaging with the content unless they were really sick. Okay, they could be at home working on this stuff. Okay, they can they can access all those resources uh, and they're great lessons for when you're away. So I left a couple hyperdocs for my chemistry class this morning. So they were going to do a little bit of reading in their textbook. They were going to watch a couple videos. They were going to create their own understanding of intermolecular forces while I was away. Now I'll have to go back. I'll have to debrief. I'll have to do some classical instruction, but they'll already have a really good background when I get back there tomorrow. So there's some amazing resources out there. Um, the HyperDocs website has millions of templates that you can just go and access for free. The book is really good as well, the HyperDocs book. I bought it on, on Amazon Kindle for $7. And it's, as a book, as a digital book, it's also a HyperDoc. So it has live links in there to all the templates and all the different apps that are used. Okay, there's really great simulations that you can pull in. Um, so gizmos and that, um, videos from, from TED-Ed and YouTube. I mean, there's really good content up there. Five years ago, six years ago, you couldn't really rely on the stuff that was on the web to capture the kids' attention. Now you can. For instance, I throw a lot of minute physics in there. I'm not sure if you're familiar with minute physics, but they're, they're just short videos. Uh, very captivating, students love them, they're really simple and easy to follow, and they bring high-level physics ideas uh, to a level where high school kids can, can grab them and run with them. Uh, you, can, you can have these um, creators of content, like these word walls, like Wordle and, and Padlet, and then you can also build in your, your apps for formative assessments, so things like uh, Google Sheets and, and Google Forms, Padlet and Wordle are great, uh, Kahoots, if you happen to use those, you can link to them, and then it's a nice, easy way to share that with your students. We're going to look at a couple of examples. This is a math one. Actually, have a look at it. So this is a math one. The students pick their own learning strategy as they go through. Uh, so they're presented with this question at the beginning. And then they have to go through a discovery phase. So they can either choose a video, they can choose a reading, or they can choose a lesson uh, from the teacher at the front. There's an extension section where they can go and, and grab some more information. They have to record their learning. In this case, they were using Snagit. Sometimes I'll use um, Google Hangouts on Air as a way of capturing student learning. And then they have to do a little communicating at the end. So they have to meet with their teacher to discuss what it was they learned, how they learned it, and prove to them that they were able to learn it. And the nice thing I said again about uh, Google Doc is that students are going to be at different phases of this for the periods. And so you can constantly be redirecting them to other links, other resources, um, while you're meeting with other students to do that assessment piece. So this is one I, I use for chemistry classes. It's pretty simple. This is sort of in the early days of me using 
using HyperDocs. This was a little homework assignment. So they went and they watched this TED Ed video, okay? And then they had to conceptualize it. So they had to answer some questions. They had to dig a little deeper. So they went to these, these links here, dig a little deeper on it, and then answer some follow-up questions. And I used the answers to these follow-up questions. I actually, it wasn't linked here, but it was, it was on Google Classroom. It was, a, it was a Google form, so I could see all their answers as they were doing their homework. And I used that to kind of kick off the next day so that we could all sort of start on, on a level footing. We all had a background in, in equilibrium. I knew where all the misconceptions were. It was, it was a really useful document, and it was really simple. It was just a homework assignment. There's lots of different ways to capture student learning through this process. So uh, Sheets or Google Forms. Does anybody use Seesaw? Anybody use Seesaw here? So I have my students, uh, uh, when they do do handwritten solutions to things, um, I have them upload a picture of it to Seesaw. They all have Seesaw accounts. Um, and then I can see that they're getting the written work done and they have a portfolio of their work at the end of the year. Uh, and then recently I've been using YouTube a lot for students to, to capture their work. Is yeah. it like Seesaw? Like yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, here's what it kind of looks like in action. So we might meet at the beginning of the period, uh, do a little debrief from the last day. We might take a quiz or we might take up some homework questions. They all have their Chromebooks out. And then somewhere usually around the 15 minute mark, that's when they're going to break free. And so you start to see the kids move around. They start to get into little groups. At the back, I have kids who are working with a motion detector, and I'm back there sort of coaching them and talking to them and doing assessment. So kids are moving around. They're moving between stations. Okay, They're trying different things, trying different resources. At the end of it, hopefully, they have a good understanding of what, what the learning goal was for that. So whether they pick the station at the back, or they pick to watch the video, or they pick to read the resources, or they pick to work on the questions, at the end of it, hopefully, everybody has a good good understanding of the material for that day. And I want to share with you some of the ones I've done recently. So here's one that worked really well. So this was stations for graphing stories. Uh, so they had a couple different stations they could go to. They could go to this one, uh, which was linked to another Google Doc, where they worked in teams to do this graphing story. They could watch any of these video lessons that were available for them, um, all of them graphing stories. And, and what they are is, it's, I took directly from this, this guy in California, he'd already pre-made PowerPoints uh, as video lessons on these topics. So I'm just using his stuff, using his content, providing it for my kids. So they would go and they would watch his videos, of him talking them through a topic. So average versus instantaneous. There you go. And what I could do while they were doing this, some of these weren't actually linked. Some of them were, were just things that they were doing on paper in the classroom as well. I could go around to those stations and check in with them. So while I had you know, a quarter of my kids watching the video, I could be over here with these other kids who were graphing by hand. Other days we might do something like this where it's very linear, okay? Or students have an option between two stations. So station one would be to watch and answer some questions and do a couple little things. And station two was at the back of the room with the motion detectors and they were generating data. And then they would switch. And that allowed me to be at the back of the room while they were generating their data, talking to them about their understanding of the data that they were generating. And then their homework was once I had all that data, I shared it with them as a Google Sheet. They had to go home, graph it, do an analysis, and hand it in a Google Classroom. On this day, what was kind of neat, what's nice about these, these Google Docs, is they had to create their own graphing story, and I had them submit it as a Google Form. So they went into the Google Form, typed in their story. I had a sheet full of stories. And then I was able to distribute them as our warm-up questions the next day. So the students had to work on content that was created by other students. And so what they did was they worked on that story the next day, then they had to find the kid who had created that story, check their graphs with them. And so they were not only creators of the content, they were the markers of the content as well. They were giving each other assessment uh, feedback. It was really, it was really nice. And here's our 
And now here's our sports analysis major assignment. So it's also a hyperdoc. Okay. Um, there's an outline of what they're going to do on each day. And what they had to do was share the document with each other with contact information so they, they could work on it after school hours. And they went through this document here and they had to highlight science, technical, vocabulary, key information, things they need to find out or things they need to discover for themselves. And they went through the document, highlighted it all for themselves. Then, as a group, they added to this section. There are no need to know your next steps for their analysis. And then they went here and got their raw data for their analysis. And this is just a simple Google Sheet. Again, they could share it with each other, okay? And they were to create graphs and then do their analysis. Each student in a group of four was assigned one person's trial. So they were doing individual work, but they were doing it collaboratively. So they had to, once they did their individual analysis, they had to come back and compare their analysis for the two athletes as a group of four. And then their final product was they had to take all of this, put it into a Google Sheets presentation, present it on the computer, and upload it to YouTube. So it was, there was quite a number of steps in there. A lot of them weren't super comfortable um, presenting live on the computer. Okay, but I think that's it's a really important point for century skills, that ability to create online content, create content for an online audience. And not all of them are going to be YouTube superstars, but I think just being able to be comfortable presenting their analysis and knowing that it's going to go online and knowing the tools that are available, I think that's important. I think that's important for them to have. I want to show you uh, one more example here. So this was our first day in this unit. Uh, so it was Vectors Day 1. They were really unfamiliar with this, this mode of learning. Um, so this was a good starting point. They had two stations to choose from. They could do the Engage Station or the Understand Station. Okay, the Engage Station was to watch the video, answer the questions. Uh, the Understand Station was just a question that was asked of them, and they had to solve it. They'd never seen these before, but it allowed them to, in a group, um, attack a question collaborate, brainstorm, come up with a solution, okay? Um, and then they, they took a picture of their solution and uploaded it here. And then when we were done, we had several different solutions posted here. We, we shared this document all together. And what was nice was um, we got to sort of look at the benefits of each solution and how people approached it, how people approached it differently. Uh, at the end, they did an activity uh, where they had to answer these questions uh, based on a map. I, I gave them a printout of the map, but they were able to check their answers in this Google slide. So all the answers for it. Here. And so they were able to sort of do a self-assessment as they went. Again, that's, that's really nice because I can go around and help students, but I can't help them all at the same time. So they could go in and check their answers. That's another sort of powerful thing with these hyperdocs is you can have answer sets that are linked to your hyperdoc. So we have about five minutes for for questions. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah. Um, okay. So you created these. These are basically Google Docs with hyperlinks. Yep. Are you always giving each student their own individual copy, or is it is it is it always shared amongst everybody? It's different different days. Different for different lessons. It depends on what I okay. depends on what I feel like or what I think is valuable. And what's your uh, sort of more more preferred way for sharing in the Google Classroom sharing the docs? Yeah. Or yeah. So track? Google Classroom is a real simple, right. easy way to get them out there to the students. Okay. And uh, oftentimes I'll have them make a copy, and then we can also work on a shared copy. Right. So they can have their own copy that they can work on, and it could be for rough work or it could be for for whatever. It's their own retained copy, and we can also have a shared copy. With, this is one of the problems that came up. So a number of teachers at school tried this and, and 
they shared their work with me. I want to show you maybe a couple more examples. Um, with like grade nine and ten applied kids, a shared document amongst the whole group is not a good idea. Yeah, because they will start editing each other's stuff, writing inappropriate stuff, uh, deleting content, messing up links. There's a chat feature, so you have to be on it monitoring your chat feature. Or share Can I show you guys this one? This one is a beautiful use of this. This is an English teacher at our school. It's a Google Slides presentation, and she just made the first page a map with points for Lord of the Flies. Maybe teach English, Lord of the Flies. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're familiar with it. And each of these in presentation mode, each of these points links to another slide where they have to put a description of that location. And so each student was, or a group of students was assigned a different location on the map that they had to write a description of, things that happened there, and one quotation that would be pertinent about that location in the book. So this is another great way where students create sort of a shared understanding. Uh, they create a shared resource that they can all access. It was a very innovative way uh, to, to do this. So if you were setting to have a page, so if it's hyperlinked to another page, are you just sharing it with the kids that you want to do that portion of it, or everybody can access this, it? Uh, this was shared with the whole class, okay. and they were assigned different locations right. on this map. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. How often do you switch between these lessons and formal lessons? So for the first unit, I tried to go all these lessons, all these sort of blended learning lessons. And the kids got real tired. They got real worn out uh, yeah. because it is a lot of self-directed and they would get lost a lot along the way. So I've sort of said, you know, my commitment for the rest of the year is to maybe do, for every unit of 10 lessons, maybe do four of these and six classical lessons. Uh, just because they're, you know, they find it exhausting. They, they do because they're, they're working hard the whole time. Uh, to learn the content and engage with the content. And, you know, a lot of times they don't know which is the best path for them to choose for their own learning as well. Yeah. Yeah. So they might think that video is the best way to go, but then when you touch base with them, they weren't really listening to the video. They just had to really entertain. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Any, any other questions? Yeah. With regard to when you have them post on YouTube and things, are there any privacy considerations? Yeah, so I tell them all to set it to, to private and then just share with them. Um, and other teachers in our building have done the same thing. So they've had kids, you know, grade nine essential kids, create like a, a Mythbusters video on, on YouTube. And, you know, those kids are not comfortable sharing their content with the whole world. So we just tell them set it to private and then share your link with each. You know, you can just set up a Google form, they paste their link in there, then you have them all in a Google Sheet, and then you can go through and mark them. You can make an individual Google channel that only your class right. has access to as well. So yeah. all the videos are public to the kids in the class, and at the end of the semester, you just take away that privacy setting and it's yeah. available to nobody but you. Yes, yeah, yeah. I'm not sure if you have an answer to this question. Um, I'm finding that YouTube is more and more filled with student projects, especially yeah. in history, mm -hmm. and so it gets harder and harder to find high-quality videos on YouTube. Yeah. Any um, um, search suggestions that you have for how you might be through some of that to get out with the student products that are filled with mistakes sometimes. Yeah. You know what? I see a lot of the same thing with physics. So, like, I like to find my minute physics videos, but a lot of kids are making their own minute physics right. videos, and they're they're not very good, and they are inaccurate, right? For, for, for history, what I find is anything that's a recorded PowerPoint, automatically rejected. Anything that has people talking to the camera, automatically rejected, that narrows it down a lot. Yeah. But, yeah, I mean, find, find good creators of content. So. Like in science, I use like SciShow Juice, Minute Physics. Um, ask you know, ask people in your professional associations where's the good where's the good YouTube content, and then subscribe to them so that you know you're always pulling from their channel. Okay, well, thank you very much. It's a great audience. Thank you.